we really appreciate how well you did. I was amazed at your range, to be honest with you. I'm like, look at that. Look at that. Look at, and <laughs> since we had so many auditions, you believe it or not, this in the the first, second, or third line, um, most of the people were reading it not the way it was written. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's just a little bit. And finally, so it it stood out instantly. Um, your first line or two, but your range, though, we're like, well, I guess that's how he sounds now. I guess that's how she sounds now. Sounds perfect. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like, who needs? J this is gonna sound terrible, but um, we said this, my wife and I. Who needs Jim Dale? <laughs> we love him, but who needs who needs Jim Dale when you got when you have Graham back? She heard the faintest sounds of an ice cream cart. Mr. Snowflake, the ice cream man and milkman, was pushing his cart in her direction. She hurried to him. Hello, Mr. Snowflake, Violet greeted him. The tall man wearing a uniform and bow tie smiled. He said, Hello, Violet. Today, you want an ice cream cone. Why, yes, I do, she replied. Mr. Snowflake continued. Today... You want your ice cream cone to be strawberry and vanilla swirls dipped in hot fudge. That's exactly what I want. It's like magic the way you always know exactly what I want before I do, Violet wondered. I know it seems like magic, but it's a natural gift in my family. Passed down from my grandfather, he said, handing her the treat. Violet enjoyed the first ice cream of the season. The two of them watched all the children in town playing happily in the field, and they marveled at the colourful kites flying gracefully in the brilliant sky. It was another gorgeous day in the town of Darlinia. You would never know it was supposed to be winter, but this town had something others didn't. It had its own special sun to warm the day. And it had a big orange pumpkin that happened to be flatulent. Rodney Evans, how are you? I am good, doing good, Graham. How are you? I'm I'm going great. Now, where are you? I am in Winchester, Virginia, in the Shenandoah Mountains outside of the Washington, D.C. area. Okay, I've been to Washington, D.C., so how far outside Washington is it, just so I can get my bearings? I am 75 miles a little northwest of Washington, D.C. Right. 75 miles. And actually, on my regular job, that's where I'm supposed to work, in Washington, D.C., 75 miles away. So what do you do? What is your day job? Oh, I actually work for the federal government right now. Uh, well, you're so, in Washington. Everybody does. <laughs> yes. I mean, yeah, I do that. Um, but, you know, I haven't been to work in two and a half years almost. I work from home just like you so right there you go i work for the um i'm not going to name the agency but uh we make loans to small businesses and okay. commercial enterprises all yeah. over the country so right there you go with that so you're changing people's lives that must be pretty fulfilling you know what we are changing people's lives i'm a part of that group i'm a part of that team i'm a part of that effort and it makes a difference in our economy and the lives of millions of people every day Wow. Oh, that's great. That's good. Because you've done all sorts of things. You were in the Coast Guard, weren't you? Yes, I was. How uh, long I'm did you do that? Actually, for 20, you know what? For 25 long, short years. Yeah. It, wow. it, it's, it's one of the best things. I, it's the best thing I've ever done in my life. So, so, in United, so how did you get into that? And then more importantly, why did you decide it was time to leave? Well, I got into it. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm the guy who said, I will never join the United States military. <laughs> but um, I was in college one day and a friend of mine came to my room after to my dorm room after one of the elections. And uh, he was bailing on his education, going to join the Coast Guard. Right. And he said, Rodney, you should really look into the Coast Guard. You're going to like them. And they had a recruiting office down the street about two miles. So I went to the Coast Guard and they never recruited me for the military. And I said, you know what? This is different. 
They have a right. whole different set of missions, a whole different kind of people, a whole different purpose. So next thing I knew, I joined the Coast Guard Reserve. Right. Wow. Mm -hmm. And did that lead to the, the regular Coast Guard or did you stay as a reservist? Well, I was a reservist, and believe it or not, in corporate America. So I had a corporate America day job in finance, if you will. And then yeah. I had my Coast Guard Reserve duty, you know, once a, you know, once a month and so forth. And yeah. then guess what happened? It happened. 9-11 happened. Okay. And when 9-11 happened, I got called up, of course. And yeah. uh, all of us got called up. But I happened, they happened to keep me. Check this out. Um, they only gave us one year orders. So right. they would renew your orders every year if they were going to keep you. And they renewed my orders every year, not everyone else. And then they offered me a contract to go to Washington, D.C. to do a specific job. And believe it or not, they gave me two, no, three more contracts. So they kept me all that time. Wow. Wow. Well, you must have been a valuable asset to them. You know, I never thought of it that way. <laughs> but if I do think of it that way, no, they actually did keep me. And I ended up doing, I mean, all that time, I did some wonderful things, had some wonderful experiences, and met some outstanding people. And actually, you know, kind of, and it made an impact not, on, not only on me, but on my family and my children as well. So the Coast Guard is the best thing that happened to me. I'm going to tell you this, too. And I'll stop. I met my wife in Coast Guard school. Really? She's in the same line of work? She was. Um, we had a class. You know, we, you know, you go through classes. She was in class 288. I was in class 388. And there was one month overlap. And we are together today. How long? Ooh. Oh, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. <laughs> If you, you know what, if you were to ask her, she's not going to know. Okay. Uh, we don't count. We don't count. We don't, we don't count. We don't count. And that's how you know things are going really, really good. Yeah. Yeah. We, my, my, my wife and I had a similar discussion today. We know it's around 35 years, but neither of us knew straight away exactly what it is. Yeah. That's when you know it's going good. Yeah. You're doing something right, man. Both of you. Yeah. Beautiful. So your friend who, who, who spoke to you in the dorm that day, he changed your life then, didn't he? He did. In a lot of ways. W what was the best thing about working in the Coast Guard? W you know, what's the best day look like in the Coast Guard? Best day? Wow, that's a, that's a hard one. Um, let me say that one of the, the most important jobs I've ever had was, was actually being a part of search and rescue. Yeah, I bet, yeah. And I was search. Let me tell you this one. It'll sort of give you an idea. I was search and rescue mission command supervisor for Atlantic Area Command. And I'm going to, if you start at the west edge of Texas, you know, yeah. this is America, of course. The Gulf, you go yeah. east. Yeah. You keep going to the Atlantic Ocean. And yeah. You pass Europe. Yeah. Go to the Mideast. That was our territory. Wow. <laughs> and, right. So one Christmas, one Christmas, we had a, a, a um, we had a uh, rescue case that took place um, around the equator between. I mean, it was a U.S. supply ship going to Cape Town, South South Africa, and the guy got himself. He got a cut on his leg and went into a diabetic coma. Wow! And we had. I had to go through three different languages, speak to about four or five different search and rescue mission command supervisors or search and rescue um, centers all over South America and so forth. And it was a Christmas day. And finally, after two days, we finally was able to get this guy off that ship. And we, you know, we're in the command center. And we, when he finally got lifted, we, you know, it was Christmas. My family was away. And after we got him done, we had our Christmas dinner. And everyone was happy because everyone participated. Yeah. That's really cool, isn't it? Because you all know you've, 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 
you've saved a life. You've you've done it. You you've done what you're there for. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We get people volunteering. For example, the flight surgeon that day for those two days. You know, people have these rotations of flight surgeons. We always have to have a medical doctor to to um, advise us in these cases. And he was not supposed to be on duty, but he wanted to follow that entire mission to the end. So on Christmas Day, in between his Christmas dinner, he's on the phone with us making sure this guy is, is safe and it's not even his duty day. That's wow. what a good Coast Guard is like. People volunteering and doing their best. Yeah, so it's a it's a proper lifestyle. It's a calling. It's more than just a, a job. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. That's great to know. Great to know. Well, thank you for your service. I'm glad glad you're out there, or you were out there, and now you're still making a difference to people's lives. So that couldn't have been in Washington because there isn't a hell of a lot of coast in Washington to guard. Yeah. No, 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 no. <laughs> Where was this? Um, um, Atlantic Area Command was is actually in Portsmouth, Virginia. Right. Portsmouth, Virginia, about five right. hours uh, southeast of here and about four hours south of Washington, D.C. Right. And did you grow up there? No, no, not at all. Not at all. Where did you grow up? up? I grew up in Mississippi. Gulfport, okay. Mississippi. Did you know now that I, area? I've been to Mississippi. I, uh, when, I was, when I was in radio full time, I still have a, 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 a weekly radio show, but when I was a... a a, a morning show guy i went to a, a convention called the morning show boot camp uh, i went every year actually and this year it was actually in new orleans so mm-hmm. rather than fly to new orleans and go to the convention i flew to memphis and right. drove south through the delta took wow. a week and just we didn't book any me and my wife we didn't book any hotels we just stayed in super eights and whatever was on the road and we tried to stick as close as we could to to old highway is it highway 61 or 31 which one is it? it's the old highway south from from memphis to 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 new orleans we met the coolest people the nicest friendliest people we've ever met in the u.s on that trip and uh, we, we, you know, because we followed the blues at, at the time. Oh, we yeah. fo- so we went to, well, from Memphis, obviously, but then we went to, to, to Roseville and we went through Indianola, Mississippi, where B.B. King was from. We saw the plaque at the place where he used to busk on the street. We went to Clarksdale, Mississippi, um, yes. and we, we discovered um, Morgan Freeman's club, which is called Ground Zero. We went to the Crossroads which isn't far away from there. And uh, we just had a great time. Uh, and just, you know, we just drive and we just say, should we stop here? For, yeah, we'll stop in this little town for the night. And uh, yeah, it was great. So whereabouts in Mississippi? Well, you, there you go. Um, first of all, it is, I am surprised I'm hearing those names of those cities <laughs> <laughs> from across the ocean. But, Jackson, um, Mississippi was a big one. I think that's the capital, isn't it? It was a, That was a is. big city. Yeah. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Um, um, I am actually from, if you start in Rosedale, Mississippi. Yes. I am 300 miles, almost 350 miles south of that, all the way to where you have the white sand beaches to the Gulf okay. of Mexico. That's all right. Home. Right. I see. Right. I grew up. Um, I grew up. Actually, I grew up walking to the beach every day when I was a kid at sunset. That's how close. Wow. What a great way to be a kid. Have a beach on your doorstep. As a seven, eight, nine year old watching the sunset and walking home. That's wow. home for me. Wow. And what were you reading as a kid? Everything I get my hands on. Um, really? Yeah, my, you know, the book that actually stands out, I was a part of the Weekly Reader Club. Um, and what was that? I read, what was the Weekly Reader Club? Well, um, back when I was in elementary school, there was this club where, you know, in school you sign up and you get, you get one book a week or two books a week or three books a week and you get new books that way. Yeah. And I was, I was a signatory to that. Plus, I read everything in the school library that I can get my hands on. Um, so I, I did that and loved reading as a kid. And were there particular books, particular genres or particular subjects that you were attracted to? 
I loved everything, but my favorite thing is science fiction. Really? I reading science fiction when I was really into it around 12 years old. And what was it about science fiction? Um, well, let's see. It, everything was new. Yeah. Everything was wonderful. You could, <laughs> I mean, you just opened up not just the world, but you opened up the skies and the heavens and everything, period. And, you know, it's just something that just tugged onto my soul. I have no idea why it stuck with me, but I'm still a science fiction aficionado. Right. So when did you then start writing? Like seriously starting to, to put stuff together that you thought, I should, I should put this stuff out one day? Um, let's see. That's a, that's a question more into this part of my life. Um, oh, the, the actual writing part came much later. You weren't a, a, a big story writer back when you were growing up? No, I never wanted to write. I, I really? Mean, I never, never wanted, I never wanted to write. The only reason I ever wrote anything to begin with was because of this little thing called bullying, the cute bullying. Because my teacher, my high school English teacher, made sure that I wrote something for the school, um, for the school publication. She's like, you're going to write something. I'm like, no, I'm not. She says, yes, you are. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. <laughs> so I wrote something. And, but with these stories here, though, with these stories here, yeah. Um, the long and short of it is it actually starts with my Coast Guard time because, right. you know, I have, I have my days in the Coast Guard. A lot of them were just fascinating. And my children, the two children who are at, you know, at home at the time, they would love me. They, they, you know, we didn't watch the news. We didn't do a whole lot, you know, when it comes to TV back then, but my children would like, daddy, tell us about your day because we had fantastic rescue days, you know? Oh, man. And, and I would, you know, I would tell them the story. They love me telling their stories, those stories, but you know, it's the coast guard. So sometimes there was just no happy ending. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And I would just make something up on the spot for the children. <laughs> yeah. And one day, one day I did it. And for 30 minutes, I just riffed and they were just all over the place, giggling and laughing. And they said, Daddy, you got to write that one down. Yeah. And they bullied me for three months. <laughs> nice bullying, cute bullying some kisses and some hugs <laughs> and I finally started to write seriously because of that those kisses and hugs and those smiles that's how I started writing the flatulent pumpkin and that's why all of your books so far well all the ones I've well obviously the one I I narrated but but the the other ones I've I've researched as well they all seem to be children's books that's because you're writing them with your own kids in mind well, um, yes, and because they also helped to some degree. Mm -hmm. They they really helped. I would bounce ideas off of them. And, you know, when I would be writing, I would come upstairs and say, you know, I, I was writing in the basement, and I would come upstairs and I would ask them a question. How does this sound? How did that sound? And you know what? For 30 minutes, they engaged with that idea. And they took that idea and they ran. And finally, I had to, you know, I had to, I found myself having to cut it off because the conversation that I started, because what I was writing just made them continue and continue and continue and continue. And I had to cut it off. I got to go back and write. I can't stay here all the time. You guys continue on. Having too much fun. <laughs> yeah, they were having too much fun. Well, let's talk about uh, about the, the book Gone with the Wind, which is the one that I've narrated. It's the flatulent pumpkin. Uh, pumpkin. It's book four, isn't it? It but is I, book four. Is this the first one that's become an audio book? Yes, it is, Graham. Why did you choose number four for audio book then rather than number one? I chose Gone with the... First of all, this is in my... To me, this is a special book. Right. This is also the one I've gotten the most, by far the most feedback from. Right. And that feedback suggests that this is the one that I start with. This is also the one that I knew actually um, is where I caught my stride, if, right. if I want to call it that. Yeah. 
I mean, that is why it's 8,000 words long and not smaller like the other ones. And it had a special message too. And it was the message that actually made me start doing it. Yeah. Because we had a family tragedy and uh, we had a family tragedy and I was, when I work, I walk, we have a lake where I live and I was walking the lake and all of a sudden the wind blew the trees and everything and it just hit me wait a minute i need to go ahead and do this i had not even thought about it before and so it started with gone with the wind because time flies we were about to lose someone i thought would be in my life almost who's been in my life for a long time and i really didn't realize we were at that point and then you know when the wind came and i was it's a beautiful day around here i said you know what this is my dedication to my to my stepfather who's been in my life for a long time wow wow it goes that deep because it is a lovely lovely story i don't want to give too much away because it's such a it's such a lovely beautiful story i mean it, it starts out with this wind and the kids the kids in the town they use the wind for enjoyment and then they don't realize that while they're not looking, <laughs> the adults are doing exactly the same. And it's bringing out the child in them, a child that's been, that's been buried and, and life has, 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 taken them, has taken away from them. Or they haven't been allowed to show that child. And then all of a sudden they can, and they still hide it from the kids a bit. And then they, the, the, the kids find out about it. And it's just, it's, it is just lovely. Why, why, why how did your stepfather inspire that was it the fact that that adults were had the, the inner child hidden inside was, was that it or was it more from the kids perspective about about their view of adults which is also part of what the book is about well well I, first of all i i really thank you for the kind words i appreciate that and my stepfather is the wind not the the w-h-e-n win not the why the why happened years ago when it comes to my son and right. my children i found out um we were doing something and and my wife and i we're, we're we're very playful we've always been a playful family and we were doing something and having more fun than the my children i asked my son because i saw it on his face when we started having fun my wife and i and i said you guys really hate when adults have fun at things that you children think are for children, don't you? you? And he says, yeah, dad, we hate it. And I'm like, why? He says, I don't know, dad, we just hate it. <laughs> and I said, but oh, that's just, that's, that's, and that's how the, the main premise started because I needed something to show the children that adults, believe it or not, should be having fun and should be allowed to have fun and the reason why they don't have fun but i needed something brand new that the adults could do and the children could do and so that it makes so, so that it tells that story that you're you know that we're that became gone with the wind yeah that's how it, my children hate to see adults having fun but but don't we but they know how fun, it? yeah but they, the kids know how much fun playing is Surely the adults deserve deserves at least some time. I mean, they're, they're adults, so they've got to do things like be coast guards and be important people working for the government. But they do need some time to play as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. That's uh, it's great. It, that's well, tell me about the main character, Violet. Violet Jenkins. Where does she come from? Well, um, Violet is unique in a sense and that's that she has an arc she's in one of the stories previous she was a trickster she was the bad little girl oh. she was the one who was going around scaring people and making them go to the hospital i think in that story in the previous story story number two the case of the plucked chicken so she would run up i mean people were getting this disease in a sense called rooster runner phobia or chickenesia and what violet would do she'd sneak up behind people and she would say chicken and the ladies would hear it 
and it, you know, and they would run and then they would hurt themselves. And she sent them, she sent, I'm going to tell you, this is a spoiler for book number two. I think she sent 42 of them to the hospital. Wow. Wow. So this is just her redemption arc because there's a good girl in there. I mean, we, we're all, you know, we're all one person in some situations and another person in another situation. So there you go. That's Violet. She was really, really, really about, you know, you know, flying her kite. She, yeah. her determination is what actually made me bring her into this story as the main character. Right. Her determination, get that kite in this, in the sky. Yeah. Yeah. And what is the role of the ice cream man? What's, what's his role? Cause he's quite clever. You don't, you use him very sparingly, but he's very important. Well, because it's, I think the ice cream man for me is the fact that when the ice cream man comes, when I was a kid, when the ice cream man, can you hear those bells, both adults and children and, and the most senior adult, the most, the youngest child who could walk, you hear those bells and everybody animates, everyone <laughs> animates because they have their favorite that they want to go get. Yeah. You, and you don't know when they're coming. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a nice surprise. Bells, yeah. You hear those bells and people, you know, back then, you know, you know, I'm I'm old. Back then people would like, I gotta go, the ice cream man is here. <laughs> you know, and he has come running from the back. The ice cream man is here. And 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 that's how he's that's why it's a memory from me of me to all the people that I grew up with and including family. But it's also a metaphor for the wind, too, because they don't know when the wind is coming either. So it's, exactly. yeah, so it works. It works like that. It's a lovely, lovely book. And I really enjoyed uh, narrating it. How did you find the process, if this was your first one, of turning your work, handing it over to a complete stranger in another country and, <laughs> uh, and just having to go, I hope he gets this right. How did, how did that go for you from your end? Well, actually, it was, it was first of all, it's, um, your involvement, I think, made everything special. This is not me just saying this to say it. Um, um, to sort of make it succinct, so it's been an awesome process turning this story of mine into an audio book. You made it easy. But prior to this, though, when I first started the process, when I first started the process, my stepfather had gotten sick, and I actually put it out there um that i needed narrators and i had like a hundred of them almost a mm -hmm. hundred and because he was still sick i wasn't being very timely you know and then uh the worst thing happened and all of a sudden there was like almost my 100th audition and that 100th audition was graham mack oh wow wow and, and i my wife and I, she's been with me through the entire process. We thought we had narrowed, we had narrowed them down and they kept coming. We narrowed them down to three, I think, uh -huh. and then yeah. down to two. And then, and then we got that other one and I'm like, not another one. And then I was, yes, another one, Graham Mack. <laughs> and let me tell you what I did. My wife and I couldn't agree. We couldn't agree. We could agree. Like we agreed that it was a, you know, you had a great read. And then we had these other people who we've been nursing through the entire process. So since I was home in Gulfport, Mississippi, I was home. I said, you know what? Let me ask someone who's not a part of the process at all. Yeah, good idea. Get a bit of distance from it. Yeah. So I took um, your audition and another audition, and I went to my aunt and uncle and my, my cousin there, my teenage cousin was there, and I said, tell me which one. And they all agreed it was unanimous. Great. Oh, was it? Oh, that's lovely. That's really nice to know. That is really nice to know. I enjoyed the audition. I, I, uh, I always have fun doing auditions because the the variety I I get to do because it's everything you know from from adult from you know um, all, all the way from murder mystery and war and science fiction and fantasy and whatever and children's books as well. And I never know, so I always. I always take it as a bit of a challenge, but when you get one like yours that is just such a lovely story with 
there's there's just um I don't know. I found myself relating relating to my childhood a little bit because of the the innocence of youth and how how everything is wonder when you're a kid. You know, you get a bit jaded when you get a bit old. And your book really captures that that thing that that uh, that kids have that it's so inquisitive and wanting to know more. And wow, what does that do? And how does that work? And all these questions and your book really had that. So thank you so much um, for, for choosing me and for saying such nice things because I really did enjoy it. I loved the process of, of working with you on this one because it was such a well-written book too. You could see it's written with, f for me, there was a lot of love came off the, uh, out of the text. I know it's off the page, which is an old, old school way of doing it. It was, I, I read them off the screen, but in the words, in between the words and in between the lines, there's just this overwhelming love for life uh, and family that's that's throughout the book. And it really is a lovely book. So thank you so much, Rodney, for letting me be part of this process. Well, thank you. Uh, we, are, we really appreciate how well you did. I was amazed at your range, to be honest with you. I'm like, look at that. Look at that. Look at, <laughs> and since we had so many auditions, you believe it or not, this in the the first second or third line um most of the people were reading it not the way it was written oh really okay yeah i mean it's just a little bit and finally so it it stood out instantly um your first line or two but your range though we're like well i guess that's how he sounds now i guess that's how she sounds now sounds perfect <laughs> you know it's like it's like who needs j this is gonna sound terrible but um, we said this, my wife and I, who needs Jim Dale? <laughs> we love him, but who needs, who needs Jim Dale when you got, when you have Graham Mack? Oh, well, they were such nice characters as well. I mean, you know, they really are, they really are good, you know, for all, the, the adults and the kids and just, just everybody in it. It's just so, they're well written and easy to do because, you know, I could get the characters, you know, a voice for the character because it was in the writing and it, they just come across, you know, and they speak to me and then I try to interpret them and, you know, and, and have a bash at it. And I figure if you don't like it, you'll tell me and I'll change it. <laughs> so I well, just have fun with it. Yeah. Let me ask you this then. Let me ask you this. And I think you sure. should say Ask this. whatever you like. This is a two-way thing. Well, I mean, which does any one of the characters register with you in, in, in your delivery? Which one did you think you got into the most? I don't know. I kind of liked Violet because there's something about Violet that I okay. think, yeah, there's something about her. And the Ice Cream Man, I think. They're, they're probably the two that stood out, I would say. Yeah, because, like I say, there's that word, that word love. There's, there's, there's a love of life and of enjoying life in there throughout the whole book. But I think... Yeah, but I also liked it when the adults started having fun and going, wee, you know, I like that too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, yes, I, I appreciate that. And and i tell you one thing, one character um, I was thinking of when I asked you that question, I said, I, I bet he says that character, and that is Uncle George. Okay. Uncle George and his cranking cannon. I'm like, <laughs> that's that's... Graham Mack is now Uncle George. You're not Uncle George, but you're Uncle George on the on the page. You're you're everyone on the page, but Uncle George. It was like that's Uncle, Uncle George, George for you. That's Uncle. That's Uncle George. Uncle George. Uncle George. So so how did you? Can I? How did you? How did you acquire such range? Do you have acting? Um. Um. Do you have acting? Um. Training or no nothing. Uh, no, I mean I worked in I worked in radio for years and I started out as a disc jockey doing morning shows. And okay. so I would do occasionally I would do sketches with with funny characters or I would um I used to have an old man character. There's a very very good radio presenter in America called Gary Burbank and he had an old man character that he used to to you know have what we call wind up calls or what would you call them crank yankers or whatever the funny phone calls when you <laughs> ring somebody up they don't know they're being recorded and stuff and so i had an old man character for that and uh, but i've always done voices and accents and stuff just for my own amusement 
And I've lived all over the world as well, so that helps picking things up. But no, no formal training in that kind of thing. Uh -huh. Just, um, but yeah, I've always, I've always messed about, and played about with with voices and stuff. And you know, I like audio. It is. It is something I, you know, when I was 10 years old, I was given an old real, secondhand reel to reel tape recorder for my birthday. And I used to, you know, record my own little radio shows on it. And then when I was 18, my parents, my, my whole family, we emigrated to New Zealand. And so to stay in touch with my friends back home, I didn't send them letters, I sent them cassettes of things. And so you find yourself doing sketches and voices and and think just to entertain my friends on the other side of the world at that stage and that no it's just it's just something i really i really it's never something i've worked at um they well, just I mean, kind of come it's, it, you've been working at it it's a lifelong thing yeah. i mean i mean i understand what you're saying but i mean those things that we start doing as a child in many cases we develop a we developed a, a depth to them as we continue in our ages, if we continue, if we stick with them, and it pretty much, and it shows. There was a friend of mine who actually does voice work. He actually right. is a trained singer. And I told him, I said, um, his name is Chris. I said, Chris, um, I've gotten somebody to do one of my books. And he says, Rodney, you have a great voice. You should do your book. You and do, said, you should do books. Yeah, well, I agree with him. <laughs> Well, I said, I, but I, I appreciate that. But let me let me say, I said, I said, I said, I may have a voice, but I don't have training. I don't have experience. I've never done this before. And if you just hear Graham, you'll understand. Graham's going to be better than me, regardless of what I do. And I, 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 this is this is a real conversation that took place several months ago, and it, it I, I can't. There's no way, Graham. There's really? No way to come in, there's no way that a person my age is going to come in and do the job um, to have the skill that you displayed. And the wow. range is just it's just not going to I don't have an old man. I'm an old man. I don't have an old man character. You know, I don't have a girl character. I don't have a violet character. I don't have a Mr. Snowflake character. I don't I don't have that. I may be able to get something like it. Yeah. I don't have it. So until yeah. that time, let's stick with the professionals. Well, I'm just playing and having fun with it. That's that's the the thing. It's the, I've been getting, you know, because I'm reasonably new at this. I only started doing the audiobooks when the pandemic hit and I was confined mm -hmm. to home, you know, and but it's like two and a half years or whatever it is now I've been doing it and I've done a I think it's 115 audiobooks. Um, it's certainly way over a hundred. It's anyway, um, I get feedback from authors and I get the strangest feedback. And it's when I hear the same thing again and again, and I think, oh, there must be something in that. And it, there's one I'm getting lately and I think, well, it sounds really obvious to me, but maybe if there's any audiobook narrators watching this or anybody that fancies doing audiobook narration, this mm -hmm. might be a tip that I can give you because you'll get more work through auditions because they've there's it's it's happened a couple of times where the author has told me why they picked me in the audition and it was something that i think is so natural i'll get to the point now and it is there was one yesterday was an example and i was playing the part of a of, it was a diary of a 14 year old boy in, from the north mm -hmm. of england and his mother shouts upstairs to him he's it's, he's waking up in the morning that his breakfast is ready and he's got to come down for his breakfast and so when I did the mum's voice, I just did like, your breakfast's ready, the bus is going to be here in 15 minutes. And I basically backed off the mic and shouted because that's, my mother would shout me. And I had another example where I was doing a book where it was two people discussing what movie they wanted to watch. And one of them walked out into the kitchen and he said like, well, what time does it start? Right. And to me, that's like if the characters are not in the same room, when they talk to each other, they're going to yell. So I just back off the mic and yell. Well, apparently, a lot of auditions that people have heard for, for those exact, those exact same scenes from their book, 
the narrator hasn't done that. They, I don't even know how they were doing. They must have said the line quietly. So maybe I just get into it a bit more than a lot of people. I don't know, because I really get into it and really have fun with it. Because it's usually like yours. It's so well written and it's so much fun to have. That's how you act that out. You just, that's what they would sound like. They wouldn't, they would sound louder. And sometimes if someone's angry, they might sound loud. But sometimes when someone's angry, they might sound really quiet. You know, and so it's all about just getting that emotion across and and to make the story come to life that's all it is for me it's not it's not it's not re reading although the words are i don't memorize them the words are on the screen and i read them off the screen but i'll often go back and do a line three or four times until i'm happy with it to, to you know if i think it hasn't really connected properly yeah well i i there you go there it is like i told my friend chris there's no way i'm gonna be able to do what graham does it's special, Graham. I, you know, we really appreciate that. Well, thank you so much for that. And thank you once again for choosing me as the narrator for Gone with the Wind. It is a lovely, lovely book. And if you sign up and you're a member of Audible, you can get it for free. If it's the, the first thing you've signed up for, that might be worth checking out. I'll put a link in the description if you're watching this on YouTube so you can join Audible uh, and get it that way. Uh, how do we find out more about you, Rodney? Well, there's no... Um, well, we, we have to wait a little bit, Graham. All mm -hmm. of my social media, I was not able to set up because of the latest tragedies that we've had. Okay, um, fine. But uh, eventually, I know there's a little bit of a bio on Amazon for you. Right. And uh, your books are available. They're all on Amazon. Gone with the Wind is on Amazon and Audible and iTunes. You can download it now. If you've got kids, this would be great to listen to with kids. You know, not just the kids, but like if you're going on a long car journey and it's kids and adults, I think you can enjoy it together because it's that kind of story because it touches on it touches on the two things there. It's not just for kids. If you're an adult and you just want to remember being a kid again, you'll love this book. Check it out. It's called Gone with the Wind. It's by Rodney Evans. What's next for you, Rodney? What's next for me is actually book six that's coming out after book four. Right. And that is 90% complete already. I just have to find the time to finish it, and then we're out there. It will be the con a continuation, not of Gone with the Wind, but the next one in the series. And I like that one, too. Great. Okay, looking forward to it. Thank you very much for your time. Cheers. Rodney Evans.